welcome everybody. Uh, it's good to, well, sort of see everybody or at least stare at my computer screen for a while. So tonight I'm gonna talk to you about something that you may remember from um, later or late in the summer that uh, this was in the news. Uh, the OSIRIS-REx mission had been studying the uh, asteroid Bennu and is on its way back to Earth with uh, a sample from that asteroid. So we're gonna talk about the mission and talk about what the satellite was actually able to do in order to help us to learn about the, uh, more about near Earth asteroids. So first, before I continue, I would like to just mention the fact that um, Yesterday was the one year anniversary of the collapse of the Arecibo Observatory. So hence the t-shirt I'm wearing, actually the background image I have. The picture you see in front of you uh, was from uh, better days when the observatory was still operational. It was the largest radio telescope in the world from 1963 to 2016 uh, in Arecibo, Puerto Rico. Um, just uh, to give you an idea of the scale of this thing, this has a dish that's a thousand feet across. And this part here, this is called the platform, which had where all the uh, operational instruments weighed 900 tons. And unfortunately due to neglect and a lack of funding to maintain the telescope, uh, these cables let go and the whole thing came crashing down. I am not gonna show the video of that. You can find that yourself, but it's you know quite distressing to watch. So yesterday was the one year anniversary of it. And I do mention it for a couple of reasons. First of all, uh, myself and my colleague, Eileen O'Donoghue, uh, took many trips down there, over a dozen, I lost count uh, after a while, uh, to the Arecibo Observatory as part of our group, uh, our consortium group that we were working with. We would always bring undergraduate students with us and uh, we would use the telescope. We actually op would operate this telescope from St. Lawrence. We would uh, be able to sit in the classroom and run the telescope and collect data. And uh, plus our workshops were always in January and January in Puerto Rico, that's the perfect time of year to go. Uh, this picture is from January, 2013. Uh, with the student that we had brought at the time who is now a PhD in astronomy and he actually just started a position at the uh, in Washington DC at the NASA Ames Research Center. So uh, this program that we've been involved with has been a great gateway for future astronomers and a lot of our uh, students that we've brought with us have gone on for advanced degrees and PhDs uh, it's quite exciting. So the other reason that I mentioned Arecibo is that it actually, some of our its observations pertain to the topic that I'm gonna be talking about today. Because this telescope not only was able to do radio observations, but also radar mapping observations, operations, which are very important for studying near earth asteroids. So uh, let's uh, first of all define what is a near earth asteroid. It's frequently abbreviated as an NEA. So first of all, you might recall if you ever took a science class back in the day that the asteroid belt is in between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter. And so this is just a look at our inner solar system. All of these white dots here represent the asteroids. So asteroids are these small rocky bodies uh, that are left over from the formation of our solar system. There's a couple of special groups of them. There's a few different colors here. I did put a label for like the Trojan asteroids and the Greeks asteroids. And you can see that they follow along in Jupiter's orbit, either behind, trailing behind or ahead of. Uh, but predominantly we have this mass between Mars and Jupiter, these small rocky bodies. They're not comets. Comets are small icy balls and they originate farther away from our solar system. But like comets, gravitational influence from the other planets nearby and collisions between these asteroids, sometimes they can actually come into an orbit that take, brings them closer to the sun or closer to Earth. Um, 
they typically don't have a tail or emit any sort of particles, although our understanding is starting to change about these asteroids. Now, the near-Earth asteroids, I'm gonna zoom in on the center a little bit. You'll notice that there are several red dots in here. Uh, it's not an accurate number, but these red dots represent the group of, a, of asteroids that we call the near-Earth ones. And they actually come much closer to our position. And because these asteroids can collide with a planet or the sun, uh, we're interested in studying them. We would like to know more about their orbits, especially the ones that come really close to Earth, and uh, hopefully be able to figure out what to do if one is actually coming close to us. Now, as of a couple of days ago, there were over 27,000 near-Earth asteroids that we knew about that NASA is keeping track of. And over 2,000 of them are both large enough and they come close enough to Earth to be considered hazardous. So it's vital that we keep an eye on these things. We could put a blinder and just wait for something to hit us, but there might be something that we could do if something that we determine that something is going to make contact with Earth. So why are we studying this one particular uh, near-Earth asteroid? It's catalog number 101955, but its name is Bennu. Why is this particular one interesting? Well, first of all, this near-Earth asteroid, Bennu, is a part of a group of these NEAs called the Apollo Group. So amongst that 27,000 plus number of asteroids. They have several different kind of, several different groups, basically based upon the orbit that they take around the sun. So the Apollo group is a, just over 10,000 of these earth crossing asteroids. So they actually will cross like this bluish line shows, uh, here's the orbit of Mercury, Venus, there's earth right there. And the Apollo group uh, are actually the ones that will physically cross the Earth's orbit. Now, Bennu, in the year 2060, we can study the orbits of planets, of asteroids, of comets, and we know where they're going to be now and in the future. And in the year 2060, it was calculated that it will pass about twice the distance of the Earth-Moon distance, which is about 240,000 miles. So let's say yeah, roughly 500,000 miles, half a million miles away from the Earth. That's considered a close pass. But about 100 years from now, in 2135, it's going to be half as close to the Earth as the distance from the Earth to the Moon. So a little over 100,000 miles. That's really close. Okay, so it's really important that we have as much information about the orbit of Bennu and any other similar near-Earth asteroids, just so we can keep an eye on them and hopefully come up with a plan if they are going to impact the Earth. Now, you may have remembered from a few years ago, a very famous Apollo asteroid. There was a meteor that blew up over Chel uh, Chelyabinsk in, uh, in Russia. And it was in one of these Apollo-class asteroids. In February 2013, it, it was this object, which was only 66 feet across. We'll see a size comparison in a few minutes. That's about a quarter the size of a football field. It actually entered Earth's atmosphere and it exploded 18 and a half miles above the surface of the Earth. Yet it released so much energy, it's estimated about 30 times the energy of the Hiroshima atomic bomb was actually released. And it shattered windows, it set off car alarms, and there were even some very weak walls that collapsed. 1,500 people were injured. Fortunately, there were no fatalities, uh, but most people were injured by flying glass. It was just windows shattered everywhere. A couple people did sustain more serious injuries, injuries if they were close to one of these falling walls. Now, the interesting thing about this particular one is because it was over Russia, um, the Russians have for quite a, uh, some time now, many of them have a dashboard camera. And if you look on YouTube for Russian dashboard videos, you will go down this rabbit hole 
of all these horrendous crashes that have all been recorded for quite a few years now. However, occasionally they capture something interesting. So I'm gonna show you this one. There's no audio for this video. This is just from some guy who's driving to work or driving around for work. February 15th, it was about 9.20 in the morning. He stops at a light and this is what he sees. Here it comes, streaking through the sky. Now watch what happens. Watch how bright it gets. And watch the shadows that actually appear on the ground. It was bright enough to create a shadow from those utility poles, from those light poles there. Wow. And he waits for the traffic to, to, to cross, the pedestrian traffic to cross, and then he goes on his way. Now, this happened when I was teaching an astronomy class, and there was dozens of videos of mostly dashboard camera videos of people who had captured this meteor streaking through the sky. And this particular one, I remember it because the guy had his music playing uh, really loud and the meteor streaks by and he doesn't say anything. Most people were like, holy cow, what is that? And he just kind of mutters something under his breath and then he goes on his way. So I figure, you know, it's like, well, you know, you grow up in Russia, life's pretty harsh there. And it's like, well, maybe the Americans have finally decided to bomb us. Maybe I should have told my wife I loved her. Eh, maybe I'll just keep on going to work. So I'm not sure what he said, but that was his attitude. It was like, yeah, eh, no big deal. However, because of the damage from this relatively small near earth asteroid created, and it was an airburst, didn't even hit the ground. Okay, this is why we wanna study these asteroids. Okay, so Bennu, let's talk about some of its properties. Uh, it was discovered in 1999 and it orbits the earth in just one over, uh, over one earth year, about 437 days. Bennu is the name of an ancient Egyptian bird god it has to do with the sun, creation and rebirth. Here's a picture from an old papyrus, an Egyptian papyrus. So this was the bird god Bennu. And that's why it was, I don't know why they chose this particular name for this asteroid. So now remember I had talked about the Arecibo Observatory. In 2005, both the Arecibo Observatory with its large radar system and also one of the Goldstone um, uh, radio telescopes, which is in the Mojave Desert in California, uh, which also could do some radio uh, radar mapping. Uh, astronomers were putting together some images. So these are earthbound images to try and get an idea of the size and the shape of what Bennu actually looked like. And so here's some various computer models based on those radar observations. I'm gonna show you that one of these pictures again in a few slides. But this shows that the size of this from their estimates was about 500 meters. We'll see a scale in a few seconds to get an idea of just what that means. And you can see it has kind of a funny shape to it, kind of a squished diamond, if you will. So here, this is from the OSIRIS-REx uh, satellite. This is an actual photograph of Bennu and the size that they determined at just under 500 meters. It's like, okay, well, most of us who don't deal with uh, the metric system, well, what does 500 meters mean? Well, here we have a scale image of Bennu next to the Empire State Building. It's bigger than the Empire State Building. It has a, a weight of about 80 million tons. So that's 80 with six zeros after it. I remember a ton is 2000 pounds. So it's really big, it's really massive. That's why we wanna keep an eye on it, especially if it's gonna be coming close to earth. Now you might notice I have a little object over here on the side. That is the Chelyabinsk meteor to scale. So I figured out what the dimensions were and I actually found some old architectural pictures of the Empire State Building. This first platform here is like the sixth or seventh floor of the Empire State Building. And that's how big the Chelyabinsk meteor, which blew up 18 miles above the surface. So yeah, we wanna know if something this big is coming at us or gonna come near us. That's really important. So let's talk about the OSIRIS-REx mission, the satellite itself. So here's the mission hatch uh, for the, the satellite. OSIRIS was named after the Egyptian god of the dead. Uh, sounds rather morbid, but 
it turns out that OSIRIS Rex is an acronym for some of the mission, some of the uh, mission part that the satellite was going to carry out. Uh, I think there's a whole division at NASA that just spends all their time picking names and making acronyms out of it. So OSIRIS, so O stands for origins. And that means that they want to collect a sample and return it. And these asteroids are carbon rich. Remember that these asteroids are left over from the uh, early formation of the solar system. So by studying them, we get to learn more about how the solar system was formed. Any, more, any information that we can gather about that is always helpful. SI, spectral interpretation. Basically what that means is that we wanna be able to be up close to it. So the satellite actually went into orbit around uh, Bennu and collect observations and compare those to ground-based observations. That will help us to understand the properties of near-Earth asteroids in general, so that when we are studying more of them from the ground, we have a better idea of what it is that these properties are telling us. RI, resource identification. So figuring out uh, the, the physical properties of the asteroid, the chemistry, the mineralogy, what actually is this asteroid made out of? Security is a huge thing. Is this thing going to hit us? Studying more about its orbit, trying to refine more about its orbit. And we'll watch later on a very brief video where they talk about the Yarkovsky effect. It turns out that gravitational forces just from the planets and the sun are not the only things that affect the orbit of these asteroids, but the sun actually heats up one side of the asteroid and the asteroids are rotating slowly. Uh, and then that side kind of rotates around and you have cooling on one side, hot, heating up on the other side. That actually creates a very, very small force and it will affect the asteroid over a long period of time. So that effect is called the Yarkovsky effect. So it's important to be able to understand that and just to get a better idea of where is this asteroid going to be in 100 years, 200 years, 300 years. And finally, Rex, regolith explorer. You may have heard the term regolith uh, from studies of our moon. Regolith refers to the loose surface material. So looking at the material, which we're gonna bring back a sample, studying the texture, uh, the morphology, how to catalog it, what's it made out of, the spectral properties, all those sorts of things. So the satellite was launched in September of 2016. It took about two years to get to Bennu. It orbited around for two years, and now it's coming back with a sample, and it's due to be back on Earth, or at least drop its sample on Earth in 2023. So here's a uh, an animation. This is not a real image, but mapping the surface of Bennu. So it has uh, multiple instruments on there. And one of the things that have is very high resolution cameras so that it orbited around for an entire year taking uh, photos at very high resolution of the surface because in order to collect a sample, the satellite was physically going to touch and do a what we call a pogo stick maneuver off the surface. So they had to pick a particular place that didn't have any big rocky boulders so that it wouldn't break the instrument. So they spent a year mapping the surface. They came up with this 3D image that we have rotating around. It's not a very high resolution, but you can see a lot of surface features and it has that sort of squashed diamond shape. Remember the Arecibo Goldstone image. This is the one that had the scale on there. Look at that. That's pretty much exactly what we're looking at. That's really cool. That's why it's so important um, that we can understand what we really see and from up close and from Earth. And this is also why it's really a huge loss to the astronomical community for the Aristibo telescope when it collapsed because it was the largest radar telescope in the world. It's the only one that could project radar of its side. There is a larger radio telescope in China, but it doesn't do radar. So for studying these near Earth asteroids, we really need a substitute that can also uh, do radar imaging. And here is a high resolution image of the surface of Bennu. 
Okay, so you can see all these rocks and boulders on there. So remember the physical size of this across is, I mean, this is huge. It's about, uh, it's bigger than the Empire State Building. So this particular image, they actually took another one that was closer up near the edge of the asteroid. And that one particular boulder is about 24 feet across. So the smallest boulders that you can see on there are probably only about a foot or two across, maybe a little bit smaller, really high resolution images. Okay, so that's excellent. Now, the next video I'm going to show was a practice maneuver for, uh, oh, I forgot about that, that's coming later. I forgot where I was. One of the other things that they were it, that um, OSIRIS-REx was able to discover about Bennu, remember I had said that asteroids are just these small rocky bodies, unlike a comet, they don't have a tail, they don't outgas, they don't emit anything. Well, it turns out that the satellite was able to detect these little dots all over the place and it would happen periodically. And at first, so right now my, background image is black. So any white dots that you see on here are associated with Bennu. At first, NASA scientists thought that maybe these were just background stars, but they saw that they changed their position. And it turns out that Bennu is actually ejecting some small particles, anywhere from less than an inch in size to about four inches for the largest ones. Some of them would actually uh, escape from the surface and go into orbit or just continue in space. And the ones that went into orbit sometimes would just land back on the surface. Not quite sure yet what is causing this. It could be because there's a lot of very small meteoroids throughout space. We think of space as being empty, but it can be very busy, especially in the asteroid belt or in remnants from the asteroid belt. So it could have been that it was just getting hit on the backside from where the satellite was. And you know there was little explosions of material. Remember I had said that the uh, side that faces the sun heats up more than the side that's away from the sun. So maybe there's some stress fracturing due to thermal differentials between the cool and the hot side. There is also, we suspect, water vapor that is in these asteroids. And maybe there's some released water vapor being squeezed out and crunched here. Maybe that's what's kind of shooting these particles out. So that's definitely something that the NASA scientists are still going to study. Okay, now we're gonna talk about the, the video. We're gonna see how the sample was actually collected. So here again is a painting of the satellite in its orbit around Bennu. And it has at the bottom of this leg, an instrument called the TAGSAM. Here's another acronym, the Touch and Go Sample Acquisition Mechanism. So this is a pogo stick. Kids, if you're watching this, ask your parents what a pogo stick is. But basically, the satellite was going to come and make contact with the surface and then fly back away. And when it hit the surface, the tag SAM down at the bottom here was going to collect some material. And that was what's going to be brought back to Earth. So here's an animation, not a real video, but an animation of what the Osiris Rex was going to do. So it would touch the surface and you're going to see some gas shoot out of here. That's nitrogen gas and inert gas. And you can see what it does. It forces the samples up into the collection area. So it blasts a little bit of that regolith up into there. These little flaps open. It collects the samples and then it moves away. Now, the speed of that animation, not sure how it relates to the actual speed, but they had designed it so that the tag SAM, the collection uh, device, would touch the surface for no longer than five seconds. And it's hard to tell when we watch the actual video how long it was actually making contact because I'm not sure of the speed of the video. But that was a computer animation of what it was going to do. Now I'm going to show you an actual video from OSIRIS-REx of a test run, and it's going to loop over and over again. So they, what they were practicing was coming close to the surface and pulling away. They were not touching the surface yet. So you see the camera right now is looking down towards the tag SAM. So there's the sample collection device right at the end. 
And so right now, again, this is a looping video. So we're gonna go down, touch and pull away. So they first had to identify a proper place to find it. And they did find uh, an area that they thought was relatively smooth, had, didn't have any big boulders in it. And we're gonna watch in a second, the actual collection video. So again, it's hard to tell how long it actually made contact with the surface, but they didn't want it for any longer than five seconds. It may have been less than that. Now, the goal was to collect enough material in the collection device so that they would have a good sample to bring back. They had enough of that nitrogen gas in there to do it three times in case it didn't work the first, first or second time. Uh, and their goal was to collect at least two ounces at 60 grams of material up to 70 ounces. 2,000 grams, that's two kilograms, that's four and a half pounds. That's a lot of material. So it's a big range that they said that they wanted to collect. And because of the mechanism they were using, they were trying to collect particles, or the goal was to collect particles that were less than two centimeters in size. Two centimeters is less than an inch, okay? All right, let's now watch the actual video of it striking the surface. And it's gonna loop again. Bam, there it goes, okay? So the really cool thing, and I'll let this run a couple of times. So again, it only hit once, the video is just running over and over again. Then the really cool thing is watch just before it makes contact with the surface, the tags and tilts so that it's at the proper angle so that it hits square onto the surface. And you can see, boom, that puff of gas, that puff of nitrogen gas blows all the material around. Okay, that was great. So they were able to determine that yes, they did get a proper sample. Now, what they, they were planning to do was after they had collected the sample, the satellite was going to back off and do some kind of a funky flip and maneuver. And they were gonna use that maneuver to be able to determine how much of a sample they actually collected. It turned out, this animation is showing, it's just like three still shots that are run together and they're just running endlessly. You can see that there's some material leaking out of the collection head. Some very small rocks got jammed in one of those flaps that was supposed to close when the uh, nitrogen gas stopped blowing. It was supposed to close and seal in the sample. Some rocks got jammed in there so that one of the flaps was open. So it was starting to lose some of its material. So basically they said, okay, let's, uh, let's just stow this thing quick. They were planning to wait a while. I forget how much time before they actually stowed it in the capsule that's gonna to return to earth. So they don't know exactly how much of a sample they got. It's somewhere between two ounces and four and a half pounds, but they do, they were able to determine that they have enough material to bring back and to study. So the sample itself, the tag SAM ended up getting stowed. Here it is being put into the SRC, the sample return capsule. And then it started making its journey, the entire satellite making its journey, took two years to come back to Earth. Once it gets close to Earth, this capsule will be ejected from the satellite and will land on Earth. We'll talk a little bit about that in a second. Its scheduled return date is September 24th of 2023. So I already think I know what I'm going to be talking about in the fall of 2023. We'll talk about what happens when that sample was landed and lands and some of the early analysis of it. So the OSIRIS-REx mission is the first one that is going to return samples from an asteroid, but it's not the first mission to return samples to Earth. Well, first of all, we know the first ones that really returned samples to Earth was the Apollo missions that landed on the moon but we had to send astronauts for that, okay? This is just a satellite, a robot working on its own. Now, there was an earlier satellite that you may recall from back in 2006, the mission was called Stardust. And this one actually visited a comet. The name of the comet, it's over here, it's pronounced VILT, number two, 
Vilt is, it's pronounced that way because it was named after a Swiss astronomer. I forget his first name, but his last name was spelled this way, pronounced Vilt. It flew through the coma, which is the head of the comet, scooped up some very thin, very tenuous material and returned the samples back to Earth back in January of 2006. This is the sample return capsule that landed on Earth that contained the sample from that comet. It turns out, it's kind of hard to tell from the previous picture, but because this mission was so successful, they actually use this technology on the OSIRIS-REx uh, OSIRIS mission. It's the same basic idea. It worked once, might as well do it again. So that's pretty cool. Now, you might think, wait a minute, we're going out to space, we're scooping all this stuff in, we're bringing it back to Earth. Is this safe? That doesn't sound very safe to me. Um, as Seth said, uh, I'm a fan of old science fiction movies. I hope some of you have seen this movie or even read the original book. It's called The Andromeda Strain. The movie came out in 1979. The novel that it was based on was written by Michael Crichton back in 1969. You might know Michael Crichton as the author of Jurassic Park. Well, this movie, I saw this, I didn't see it in 71, but I saw it in the 1970s and I liked it so much, I actually went to the library to get the original book out to read it. And the, the book and uh, the movie is very true to the book. So the uh, one thing I do want to point out here that this movie was labeled or was rated G, but they had this extra tagline, maybe too intense for younger children. Oh yeah, it was intense. Uh, because at the very beginning, it starts off with dead bodies lying all over the place, and they even have some partial nudity. Uh, that was not what we consider a G-rated movie these days. The premise of this movie is that there's a satellite that returns to Earth, and in, it was uh, its mission was to pick up interstellar uh, samples, yet some alien um, organism was on board. It landed in the wrong place. It landed in some small town in California. And this doctor picks it up, brings it to his office, opens it and kills everybody in the town. He kills everybody except this infant. So this ominous looking picture here, this is actually one of the scientists, it's actually the, the doctor in a, spa, in a protective space suit, but it's a very ominous in, image of him lying over this shrieking baby. He's not hurting the baby. He's trying to figure out why did this child survive when everybody else died? One other person survived as well. It was an old man who uh, was, uh, drank Sterno, and you can look that up. Not very pleasant. Why did these two survive when everybody else died? That's the premise of the movie. Very intense movie. If you get a chance to see it, I highly recommend it. So here's a scene from the movie. Here are the two scientists examining the capsule. They're in the ill-fated doctor's office. They're taking a look inside and actually the alien organism is in there. So you can see the protective suits that they're wearing. I thought that this is a really cool picture. This is a, a still shot from the, from the movie because doesn't this look just like the return of this, uh, the, the, the capsule that's going to return the sample to earth? Same basic idea. So even the movie makers had the same idea back in the 1970s. Pretty interesting. So is this safe? Yes, I actually found this document on NASA's technical server. And the, it's like a 15 page document talking about the, the mission in detail. And it does say that the primary um, uh, mission is to sample a pristine carbon rich asteroid and return that sample to earth in pristine condition for detailed laboratory analysis. It's a lot of details in here, but they go, this paragraph says that they're gonna be taking samples once the capsule lands on the Earth, taking samples of the capsule and the area around it, just to make sure that there's no cross-contamination. Uh, they're gonna remove the canister from the sample return canister and everything, the whole thing is going to be returned to a clean room at the Johnson Space uh, Flight Center. Uh, and they have a special room there, and that's where they're going to open it. So you know people are going to be wearing their spacesuits. They're going to be fully protected, 
And they're also having it, the map here shows where it's going to land, which is the same place that the Stardust mission capsule landed. It's in the middle of nowhere. This is the UTTR. This is the Utah Test and Training Range. It's in the middle of the desert. It's on restricted airspace. Nobody can fly over there. It's about 80 miles west or southwest of Salt Lake City. That's where it's going to land. So it's a pretty safe area there. So it's not going to kill anybody, but they're obviously taking all kinds of uh, precautions. The other thing is anything from that, uh, any part of the sample that was collected from Bennu, we don't want to contaminate it with anything from the earth. So they have to be super careful about these things. So you don't just whack it with a mallet and pry it open and say, hey, look what we got. We got a box of rocks here. Okay. So that's pretty cool. Okay, refining Bennu's orbit. That was also, remember we talked about security. We really need to understand what the actual orbit of Bennu is going to be, especially in the future, because it's gonna be making close passes to Earth. So from the close-up studies from a couple of years, and probably the numbers will actually improve, NASA was able to project for about 300 years in the future, what the orbit of Bennu is going to be, how close it comes to Earth, and its chances of hitting the Earth are much less than 1%, 0.057%. That's really low, okay? The close paths that I talked about in 2182, even lower probability. Now, this is not zero probability, okay? You can still have an extremely low probability, but something, an event can still happen. So that's why we need to study this even more. One last quote before we watch the movie is that this is from uh, Lind Lindley Johnson, a planetary defense officer at NASA. Astronomers start worrying when the impact probability reaches 1%. So, so far we're pretty good. And by studying Bennu up close, we've refined the orbit. They were able to get the percentages much lower that it's hopefully not going to impact Earth. Now, this video is just a little over two minutes. I want to show it to you because they do talk about uh, what the orbit is going to be. And they also have a nice animation, brief animation, that talks about that Yarkovsky effect. So let's watch this video. This one does have audio. So let me let this run. In 2135, a potentially hazardous asteroid called Bennu will make a close flyby of Earth. During this encounter, our planet's gravity will tweak Bennu's path, making it a challenge to calculate its future trajectory and the odds of a potential impact late in the 22nd century. Why is this hard to determine? Well, we know how gravity works, but there are still uncertainties in Bennu's trajectory that will be magnified by the close encounter. In addition to gravity, asteroids can be pushed around by non-gravitational forces, like the Yarkovsky effect. When sunlight strikes a rotating asteroid, the day side heats up, as the asteroid turns, the night side cools down and releases the heat. This exerts a small thrust on the asteroid, which can change its direction over time. The Yarkovsky effect is challenging to model, but it can make a big difference in determining where asteroids end up. Because we don't know exactly how the Yarkovsky effect will perturb Bennu's orbit, we have limited knowledge of where Bennu will be as it approaches Earth in 2135. Scientists thus have to consider a range of possible trajectories, depending on how strongly the Yarkovsky effect is pushing on Bennu. A few of these trajectories line up with regions of space called gravitational keyholes. If Bennu were to pass through a keyhole, Earth's gravity would bend its path in just the right way to cause an impact on a subsequent orbit late in the 22nd century. The odds of this actually happening are quite low, but scientists want to know as much as possible that's one reason why NASA sent the OSIRIS-REx spacecraft to study Bennu from 2018 to 2021. OSIRIS-REx greatly improved our knowledge of Bennu's position, density, thermal inertia, and other properties that can influence how its orbit will evolve over time. The new data allowed scientists to significantly reduce uncertainties in Bennu's predicted orbit, ruling out a number of keyholes for the 2135 flyby and eliminating several future impact scenarios. While Bennu remains a hazardous asteroid, we can now make better models of its orbital evolution thanks to OSIRIS-REx. This will allow us, and our descendants, to better calculate Bennu's risk in the decades and centuries to come.
So we could see there's a reason that they call this rocket science. There is so much that affects the orbit of objects, even with small forces. To give you an idea of how small a force that is, here's a quote from one of the senior researchers on the project. And it says, the Yark he, he said, the Yarkovsky effect on Bennu is equivalent to the weight of three grapes constantly acting on the asteroid. Tiny, yes, but significant when determining Bennu's future impact chances over the decades and centuries to come. So imagine taking three grapes and just hitting that 80 million ton asteroid with it. And it's like, holy smoke, that's enough to change the orbit over a very long period of time. That's why it's important to make all these studies. So what if we were able to determine that an asteroid was actually on a collision course with Earth. What could we do about it? Do we just, you know, you know, close our eyes, kiss our loved ones, and you know, I know I'm going to eat a lot of pizza and macaroni and cheese if that happens. Okay. So you may have also heard in the news just this past week another satellite was launched by NASA, and it was called the the DART satellite. Double Asteroid Redirection Test, yet another acronym. So this is part of NASA's planetary defense strategy. Can we hit an asteroid with a satellite and deflect its orbit enough so that it won't hit the Earth? Now, they chose a pair of asteroids, Didymos and Dimorphos. Dimorphos is actually orbiting around Didymos. And neither one has any chance of hitting the Earth. I can't remember why they chose these two particular ones. Here is the DART satellite itself. You may also notice that there's a little, it's called the Lycia cube. It's a, what's called a cube satellite, cube set, very small satellite. Lycia stands for the Light Italian Cube Set for Imaging of Asteroids because apparently this cube set has a third less calories than a normal Italian <laughs> cube set. Uh, so what is going to happen is, and let me show you, here's the deal. So they are sending the DART satellite and right now the cube set is attached to it. About a week before it makes impact, the cube set is going to separate and it's the one that's going to take videos of the impact. And I think it's actually going to go into orbit around the, the asteroids just so we get some more information about them. It is going to hit the surface at four miles per second. So imagine going four miles in one second. It's traveling incredibly fast. Right now, the orbit of Dimorphos is along this white circle. The goal is to hit it head on and change the orbit so that it will then go along the blue circle. And just this past week, I was listening to a podcast uh, where they were talking to one of the principal scientists uh, for this mission. They're hoping to change that orbit by only 10 minutes. It'll become 10 minutes shorter. Yet it's basically a proof of concept that we could actually do that, that we can physically change the orbit by hitting it with something. The plan is to for the impact to happen next September, September 26th of 2022. So I think I know what I'm talking about next fall. So I have my next two falls worth of talks all set up, I think. So you might say, hey, Jeff, wait a minute. I hear Bruce Willis is really good <laughs> at hopping on a space shuttle, going to an asteroid, digging a hole, planting an atomic bomb and blowing the whole thing up. Why don't we just break him out of, you know, all the crappy movies he's been doing these days and send him out there to blow it up. It's like, well, it turns out that's a really bad idea. If you've ever seen the movie Armageddon, 1998, love that movie. Fantastic movie. The science is terrible in that one. If you blow up an asteroid that is coming to Earth, uh, that's on an impact collision with Earth, basically what you've made, instead of one big one, now you've made two, well, not really that smaller ones, and all these extra shards, you're actually going to do 
a lot more damage. So instead of getting hit by a big bullet, now you're getting hit by a big shotgun blast. Not a good idea. That's also why it's so important to be able to keep track of these near Earth asteroids. We want to try and detect them as far away from the Earth as possible so that we, and, and to be able to figure out their orbits so that we have plenty of time. It would take a much less, a, a much lower impact if it's farther away to be able to deflect it than if it's really close to us. That's why all of these studies are so important. So just to give you a sense of scale of what DART is going to hit. So they have on, on their uh, NASA's website, they have this beautiful graphic that shows some things to scale. Here's a, a regular bus about 14 meters long. The DART spacecraft is about 19 meters long. So it's not much bigger than a big bus, okay? Um, I looked up its weight. The satellite only weighs about 1,300 pounds. It's only two thirds of a ton. Remember a ton is 2000 pounds. So it's about the size. I actually looked up the second car I owned <laughs> was a 1980 Datsun 210. It weighed about 1600 pounds. Most compact cars these days with all the safety features, they're probably closer to 2000 pounds or so. But think of it as a really small compact car. That's what we're trying to hit dimorphous with. Dimorphous, you could see, is bigger than the Statue of Liberty, okay? So it's a pretty substantial rock. It weighs about 5 million tons. So what we need is to be able to hit it with something small, but with a lot of kinetic energy from a very high velocity. Didymos, okay, which is the, the uh, larger asteroid that Dimorphos is orbiting around. You can see how large it is, bigger than the World Trade Center, 780 meters. If you remember, Bennu is only 500 meters, okay? So it's half again as big. This one has a weight of about 600 million tons. If we had to deflect something like that, we probably need a bigger satellite or have to hit it much farther out, okay? That's what they're trying to figure out with the DART mission. Can we do this? What is the effect? How fast does a satellite have to go? How big does it have to be? Or do we have to have some sort of a nuclear blast not to blow up the asteroid, but to be able to deflect it? That's what you're gonna be hearing about over the next five to 10 years is this kind of stuff. Because as the technology has improved, we've discovered, like I said, there's over 2000 near earth asteroids that are potential hazards. We've got to keep an eye on all of them. So that's all I have to say. I leave you with one final image, actually two final images. Um, this was from my last trip to the Arecibo Observatory in 2015. And um, one from a recent trip. Now we've been using in recent years, the Green Bank Observatory in Green Bank, West Virginia. And this telescope is the largest steerable. So it actually turns around like this, can look at different areas of the sky, largest steerable radio telescope in the world. It's only about, um, oh, I think it's about 300 feet across. I can't remember, it, it's, but it's big. I don't know if you can see, I was gonna blow up the image and I forgot. You might be able to see there's a little tiny thing here. There's a little tiny thing here. When we went back, this was from 2017, uh, there were actually workers who were hanging off of the dish. They were actually uh, painting and, and cleaning up the rust from the dish. That's a person. These two are humans actually here. Gives you a sense of the scale of this structure. So a little bit happier image to study with. And we're actually gonna be observing with this telescope uh, hopefully in person in June and certainly remote observing uh, from St. Lawrence in, uh, University in Canton, New York. So thank you very much. If anybody has any questions, I'd be happy to answer them now. And uh, I also leave you with a final image of what our plans are going to be. Hopefully um, this is what we're planning to build in the future. So thank you very much. I'll stop sharing my screen and uh, I will be happy to answer any questions you have. Excellent, Jeff. Thanks so much. Uh, Thank you. Uh, humor and fear at the same time. That's, that's what I got from the moral That's of my the motto. <laughs> Is there anything that, uh, uh, any uh, 
telescope in, in our future uh, that will replace the radar capability of Arecibo? No. And this is, this is a big problem. And um, there's been a lot of discussions. I was actually uh, a couple of weeks ago attended a virtual conference that was all uh, about Arecibo. And they talked about what the future plans were. And the idea would be, yes, we would like to rebuild Arecibo, something much better, much uh, more modern. In the same location, they could actually, about a third of the uh, actual the dish was destroyed, but two thirds of it are still intact. So that could be repaired. It can be improved upon. All it takes is money. And so whether the funding will come through or not, that's a huge thing. Uh, but currently there's no other large radar telescopes on the boards that I'm aware of. So that's too bad. Um, yep. Uh, Barkley Zucker, uh, you're on. Why don't you uh, unmute yourself and ask uh, ask your question? I uh, thank you, uh, Jeff. I just wanted to say this is absolutely uh, thoroughly entertaining and uh, uh, very thank informative. You, I, I I was uh, uh, pretty impressed not only by the the scientific content but also the uh, video that you played. Uh, was sort of remarkably clear. <laughs> yeah. I wasn't expecting that over Zoom. It was, right. it was pretty good. Um, so I, I did post a question in the chat. Um, uh, I know Bennu uh, must be rotating. And so for this spacecraft to do a touch and go, it had to somehow like match that rotational motion, but it couldn't have orbited. Right, right, right. It had to, and you know what? And that's the one property I forgot to look at because you know I showed that animation of it rotating. It looks like it's spinning really fast, and it's not spinning that fast. But I forgot to look up what its actual rotation period was. Um, so it's probably orbiting much more slowly. But yeah, all of that has to be taken into account, uh, and that's why also the target area, which I think they called Nightingale, they had like four um, potential areas that they were looking at uh, for, to, for collecting the sample from. It had to be a large enough area. So probably if there was a little bit of drift that they would be able to, you know, not, you know, be so close to a big boulder that it would hit it because it was rotating in the way. So yeah, that's wow. part of the rock, the rocket science part too. Is like, yeah, you don't, don't just say, okay, we're just gonna go there. Let's go straight and go back. <laughs> Doesn't work that way. So so sorry, it's just sort of a follow up to this. So after it touches and, and collected the sample, uh, does it shoot off into space? Like where'd the spacecraft go? Yeah, yeah. So it backed up a safe distance. And I think the, the purpose was in case they didn't collect the sample, they didn't want to go too far. And, and I don't know how immediately they could try it again, but they could try it up to three different times. So, but once they had determined that it, had um, uh, they had collected a good sample, they stowed it, it had backed up. I think it may have orbited around again, but then it took off and it's heading back for Earth right now. So, Crazy. Yeah, yeah. Pretty Thank good. you, great, great talk. I Thank you, love Thank it. you very much. Hi, Rosie. According Hello. to uh, uh, Peter Butchko, the uh, rotational period is about four hours and that's from Wikipedia. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's the one thing I forgot to look. So it is moving appreciably, you know? It's kind of like, you know, you think of how the sky rotates and if we stand outside, you look at the sky, you don't see it moving, but you put a telescope on it where you're looking at a small field of view, you try to look at a star and zip it goes right out or a planet and it disappears. Mm -hmm. You have to have a clock drive that is moving at the same rotation rate as the earth or the sky in order to keep track of it. So yeah, the satellite has to do the same thing. So that's why you, you know, you gotta be pretty smart to work at NASA to figure all this stuff out. <laughs> and, and you have to double and triple check your, your figures. And if you rely on just whatever answer your calculator gives you, forget it, you're gonna miss. <laughs> One of our good friends, Ann Hoffman, asks, what's the expectation of the composition of the particles or rocks that are collected on Bennu? What would be unexpected? And uh, would ice or water be expected? I think they are expecting, you know, some form of water. Uh, certainly, there's a lot of carbon there. And that's the thing that they're looking for also is, you know, 
are there like the building blocks for, of life, you know? Not there, nothing would be alive on this particular object, but maybe some of the materials that form us are part of that as well. Because you know, everything in our solar system, our universe, we are all formed out of the same basic materials that you know, exploding stars, you get these heavier elements. So, yeah, there's a lot to be studied. So, I don't know the particulars of what they're looking for, what they'll be surprised about. We'll find out in a couple of years. So it's really not enough to say we are stardust anymore. We are now <laughs> asteroid dust. We are asteroid <laughs> dust. That's right. We are regolith. <laughs> that would be a good name for a band. We are regolith. Oh, that is a... I had a... I had to go and uh, register that URL online. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll buy it from you. Yeah. <laughs> what else have we got? What other questions? I have a question. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. Peter. Go ahead. Oh, great. Uh, thanks for the talk. It was really great. Thank um, you. I was curious about the radar. Um, I guess I'm a little confused. All these uh, radar telescopes, they passively accept radar, but Arecibo was unique in that it shot out radar it, and then it waited for the uh, what's it the called? Pulse uh, come back. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Oh, okay. All right. Because exactly. Uh, and me, and there, go ahead. It, and it was be, it was used for years. It studied the rotation of uh, Venus and right. uh, near you know other asteroids. And when you see animations of astro of um, radar images, they're really kind of weird. They're not like visual images so they have to do a lot of processing and computing to be able to get a visual image from a radar and from a radar signal uh but yeah that's what it is it shoots out a, a radar signal waits for it to bounce back and come and receive by the telescope are there smaller uh, telescopes with this capability that you know they usually link them together to get yes the, the, and, and improve the resolution gold, or whatever? right and the goldstone satellites there's i think like five or six, and I don't know which ones have radar capability, but they're much smaller dishes. And yeah, you can put things together, but there's not a lot of radar telescopes around. And Arecibo is just so huge that it really had the best resolution for doing that. So by combining the data from Goldstone and Arecibo, they were able to put that together to get a more complete image. Well, I'm going to make a plug for another great movie based on Arecibo. I'm sure you know it is a Contact. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Fantastic. Yes. Movie. Right. And uh, actually in Contact, um, of, of course, we watch that movie all the time. Uh, at the beginning, when she, when Jodie Foster is at the observatory, uh, they're actually in the control room. They're in the real control room. And I can see all the instruments we played with, although the technology is a lot newer. I can see the stuff in the back. Uh, there's a scene where they're on the uh, the observation platform where I showed you, you know, our, our self selfies mm -hmm. from in front of the telescope. Apparently, from what I was told by employees who were there at the time, the angle wasn't correct, so they had to build a platform above the observation platform for them to stand on, so that the the platform of the observatory would be uh, in the correct orientation. There's also a scene where Matthew McConaughey and uh, Jodie Foster get together in a cabin. I've stayed in that cabin. <laughs> um, yes, that is the Jodie Foster Memorial Cabin. Mm -hmm. uh, the external scenes were shot um, at Arecibo. The internal scenes inside, uh, when I'm looking at it, it's like, wow, that's a lot nicer than what we actually stayed in. Um, those were shot in a studio back in Hollywood. So, but they did shoot a lot on site. Another movie that was shot at Arecibo was Goldeneye, right. James Bond movie with Pierce Brosnan. I remember. And that. yes, and the Arecibo telescope was the Goldeneye weapon, which came from beneath the surface of a lake in a crater. It doesn't do that. <laughs> and then it was able to shoot laser beams and knock down satellites. Well, it doesn't do that either. Uh, but they did shoot that movie there. And there's a scene where Bond is running on the catwalk out right. of the telescope. Yeah, that was the real catwalk and, and everything. So, yeah, yeah, they shot that one there as well. So, very cool. Nice. Marlies, uh, Marlies has a great question. Marlies, you want to unmute and, and ask your question? There we go. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Hi, um, Marie. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, 
Uh, no, I, I noticed um, both the uh, W and that, I can't remember the name, but the, the other asteroid that uh, the, the dark one is hitting the satellite up. Uh, they right. both have an equatorial ridge. And I wondered, is that a common thing in asteroids? I think you're calling the small moon of Jupiter or Saturn and also as that uh, feature. Oh, oh for, 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 an, for, for an equatorial <laughs> orbit, is that what you're what you're saying? That it, that so it has an shape of the rock itself. It, it bulges in the middle. It's like a ridge right along the equator. Oh, yes. Well, and that would make sense because the primordial cloud that formed our sun and uh, the rest of the objects in our solar system was rotating. And it started rotating faster, the more compact it got. And so pretty much everything is rotating. And especially if you have more loose material that is rotating, you're gonna get that weird kind of a shape as opposed to a, as, and they're not high mass objects like a planet. You know, which is more spherical, it tends to smooth itself out. Yet, like our planet, our Earth is an oblate spheroid. The dimension around the equator, it's bigger than it is around the equatorial region. So, yeah, and that's because of rotation. And so, obviously, the composition of an asteroid, similar, smaller body. So, yeah, it's, it's kind of weird that it has that shape. Now, those images I showed you, I think those are just early mock ups. It'll be interesting once. Um, DART is closer to the double asteroid system, see how close those are. Or if they just said, well, the, the larger one looks kind of like Bennu, so it kind of looks like that image. So it'll be interesting to see what it really looks like. So we'll find out next year. I see uh, Mark Staves has his hand raised, I think. Yes. Hello, Mark. Uh, Mark's one of our founding fathers. Uh, okay, I'm just, uh, my apologies, I'm trying to navigate Zoom here on my cell phone. Oh. <laughs> yeah, wrong finger there, Mark, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I got <laughs> <one thing. It's> <laughs> How are you guys doing? Good to see everybody. My apologies for getting back late, but I had to run to Potsdam today, believe it or not, and buy some tools to fix my snowblower that I broke yesterday morning. Uh, <laughs> bad time of year to break it. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, <laughs> My, my question, Jeff, are you familiar at all with um, Haystack, MIT Haystack uh, facility at all? Uh, I actually visited there when I was a graduate student, but... I think that they have some sort of radar capability there, but I don't know if it's just strictly ionospheric or if it's... Uh, it might be. And that was a very, well, very small <laughs> telescope unless, I mean, I was there in the uh, late 80s. Um, and I don't know what they've improved with. Uh, that was in the Quabbin Reservoir or, or Quabbin Reserve or something like that. Yeah. Um, so I don't know their particular capabilities. But if it's if they still have the same size dish, yeah, it's a good size dish, but it's pretty small. So it might just be strictly for ionospheric um, observations, which is also what I, uh, Arecibo did. So it was radar radio and ionospheric studies. So all three, big loss to uh, the astronomical. What the, what the capabilities of that facility were, that's all. Yeah, 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 don't know. Okay. All right, good, thank you, appreciate yep. that. Hey Thanks. everybody, I put in our chat uh, some of the links for our website, our phone number, email, Facebook, and uh, the YouTube channel. This, uh, this presentation will be available uh, on our YouTube channel uh, within a couple of days of, of today. As our whole history, all of our uh, lecture series have been uh, posted there. So feel free to check those out if you've missed one along the way. Uh, again, I'm going to post in our chat now for uh, Giving Thursday or Thankful Thursday, I guess we'll call it, from the Adirondack Sky Center, a place to make a donation uh, during this time of year. Uh, for the conclusion of our Cygnus series 2021 and in advance of our uh, Orion series coming up in 2022 and all of the free programs and great educational opportunities we provide uh, in astronomy and science uh, and all the STEM activities we do uh, for students throughout the North Country and now via uh, the internet uh, really throughout the, the, the entire country. So we're, we're very proud of what we're doing. And we hope uh, you will show your support by making a, a gift to us 
uh, within the next couple of days during our reboot of our capital campaign. So with that, if there's any remaining questions, we can, uh, we can do that. Uh, anybody have anything else they want to ask Jeff? I know I've got a million questions, but uh, <laughs> after tonight, but I, I won't take all of our time to do that. I'll, I'll email him privately. So with that, I want to thank everybody for coming tonight. Uh, Jeff, thanks so much. Uh, never disappoints, uh, like I said, <laughs> educational and, uh, and and frightening at the same time. So <laughs> I appreciate those that, nightmares. That, that's that that's going to be on my my tombstone. That would be my epitaph: uh, <laughs> educational and frightening. <laughs> yeah, educational and frightening. That's the man he was. <laughs> Just the kind of guy Jeff is. Right. <laughs> All right. Well, with that, good night, everybody, and, and clear skies to everybody. Happy holidays, and we'll see you again in 2022. Good night. Thanks, everybody, for coming. <laughs>